Alrighty, folks, here we go. Oh, gosh, let me change that lighting again. I look like I've got the black light on. That's a little bit better. That's better still. But that's just uh, me in the dark. <laughs> it's probably better that way, huh? Can y'all hear me okay? And also, um, I tried tinkering with the volume settings. Can you hear the insects behind me? You're trying to earn money. You're going to have to remind me to pay you. Oh, somebody's not muted. You're trying to earn money. You're going to have to remind me to pay you. Uh, can y'all check your, uh, sure you're muted? Um, and uh, again, I, I tried to um, make sure I could get the insect sounds behind me. Of course, now they've kind of gone silent. But anyway, um, great to see y'all this evening. We've got a whole bunch of nature news to share. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and all right, let's uh, start from the beginning. No, nope. let's see, let's share the screen. Right. And there we go. All right. So, uh, first up tonight is uh, the topic that was uh, this past week's column, Rattlesnake Master. Uh, I have to tell you, it's one of my favorite prairie plants uh, just because it is so unique. It's, it's Because it's so unique, it's easy to identify. Um, you know, sometimes when we get into the acid, in fact, one of my first assignments when I was uh, started here at the Park District here in St. Charles in 2007, um, my first uh, walk about in the what's now the Hickory Knolls natural area was to try to learn uh, all the asters and all the goldenrods and it wasn't easy and, and I didn't succeed um, but there are certain plants that are super easy to identify because there's nothing else like them and that's uh, what is one of uh, Rattlesnake Master's finest qualities. Now uh, if we uh, if we look at the um, the plants, and then we look at that name, Eryngium yuccifolium, uh, it's actually named after the, the species name comes from the least likeness to uh, the yucca plant. But if we delve a little bit deeper into the background of this plant, we learn that um, Adelsnake Master is actually not at all related to yucca. It is in the carrot family whereas yucca is part of the asparagus family. So uh, it, it has some sort of, um, uh, you know, yucca-like or, or almost desert-like qualities to the leaf, but um, it's not because it's related to that. It is a member of the care family, um, just like, uh, say, Queen Anne's lace is also a member of the care family. So these guys are uh, kind of distant, distant cousins. Now that name too, Rattlesnake Master, would imply that there's a relationship between the plants and rattlesnakes. Um, there is an anecdotal, sorry, in fact, there, there are uh, oral histories too with some of our indigenous people using parts of the plant to A, um, treat rattlesnake bite and B, um, help keep, you, uh, keep the, the snake from biting while it's being handled. I wouldn't recommend this plant for either of those uses. Uh, however, in the past, uh, medicinal uses have been um, listed as being uh, used as a pain reliever uh, in gynecological issues, chest pains, dysentery, bloody noses, VD, <laughs> bladder problems. And then I love this one reference who just said, you can use it as a cure-all. So um, mostly the, the roots and the leaves are the, the parts that were most often cited as being useful for these various, uh, treating these various conditions and ailments. Um, but what I found most fascinating was a project that took place down at uh, Louisiana State University 
back in, um, I think this was 2005. So this isn't really news, but um, it was new to me. And I thought you might appreciate it too. The researchers there uh, looking at uh, findings from various caves that were used over the millennia. Uh, actually, some of them are, are very ancient history. Um, date back to very ancient times, but um, a lot of, uh, there, was, there were several artifacts found in these caves that are in um, central Missouri and also down in Arkansas that uh, contain artifacts made from rattlesnake nester. Um, here's uh, the Montgomery shelter, which is in Arkansas. These are undated little purses, um, two and a half inch, inches wide by three and a half inches deep. I don't know. Um, it looks like it would hold a pocket watch, but that's probably not what it was used for back then. Um, these are, are tiny little uh, bags. On the left-hand side, we see the original artifact, again, undated. On the right, we see the, um, the researchers at Louisiana State. That's their recreation of that little bag. Um, on the right, we have some footwear, also undated, but from a different uh, cave known as the Spiker Shelter also in Arkansas. Again, on the left is the, uh, the I guess you'd call this a, an out and out shoe. Um, they call it, they refer to it as footwear. It's more than a sandal, which is what some of the other, other artifacts um, were likened to. But uh, again, on the left was the, uh, the artifact and on the right was the researchers recreation. What they found that they had to do to, to make these uh, modern versions of these ancient crafts was to um, pick the leaves for the bags. They used younger leaves for the footwear. They used older leaves because by then the, the fibers in the leaves were stronger oh. and uh, held up a little bit better to being uh, manipulated, twisted, braided, um, woven together. Um, and they also found, uh, they, they knew that the plants were growing uh, near where these, these relics uh, were found. What they're not sure of and what they're kind of thinking actually, because this plant proved to be so useful to these various um, people in different uh, area, area ages, um, they're thinking that the that Rattlesnake Master was actually cultivated there because um, they used it to, to make so many useful things. Um, here we have uh, some footwear from the Arnold Research Cave in South Central Missouri. Um, and on the uh, left here, we have some bags from the Arch Vaughn Cave uh, in Arkansas. These date back to 2400 BC. Uh, the bags, again, we've got the, um, the artifact on the left and the recreation on the right. These were about 10 and a half inches long by uh, just about five inches wide. It's anybody's guess as to what they were used for. Were they used to transport uh, food items? Were they used to transport tools? Were they just um, a fashion accessory to match the shoes? We don't know. Um, the uh, shoes here on the right, Again, you can see the, the wear on the artifact. In fact, I'm not sure if it was this one or a different uh, piece of footwear that was found. It was actually uh, shown to have some repairs on it too. So it not only was it, it functional and useful and, and again, perhaps fashionable, but it was also found to be um, you know, so favored that uh, the person who wore it actually went to the trouble to repair it, which, Actually, when you think about it, it's probably a lot easier to fix it than it would be to weave an entirely new pair of shoes. Uh, we've also got some new bags here. Um, these are a little bit newer uh, from only about uh, 3,000 years ago. Uh, the relic on the left and the recreation on the right. A little bit larger bags uh, with a draw top, drawstring top at the uh, where the Ants were woven together. Uh, the website itself goes into a lot more detail. If you're looking to recreate some of these accessories yourself, uh, 
shoot me an email, let me know in the comments, and I'll direct you to the LSU website. But I thought it was just kind of cool that um, this plant that we think of as an Illinois prairie plant uh, was proven to be very useful to the indigenous people in um, down in the Ozarks in Missouri and in uh, Arkansas. Pretty neat, huh? So let's let's uh, stick with the snake theme, but in a much different way. Speaking of snakes, um, last week I said we were going to take a look at uh, uh, some some supper time videos. Uh, we, we, of course, you know, uh, if you've been to Hickory Knolls, we, we are quite fond of snakes there. And I would say our current collection includes about a dozen snakes. We started a program this num supper, uh, summer called Snakes at Supper Time and um, found out people will actually pay to come and watch snakes eat. So I thought you guys might like to see this too. But before we watch the actual video, I wanted to just clear up uh, a thing or two. Snakes, we often uh, talk about their mouths as um, being able to, like they're able to unhinge their jaws. And that's a little bit of an exaggeration. On the, the left-hand photo here, we see uh, a, a non-venomous snake's skeleton. You can see how the these rather large teeth, I think this might've been a, a type of uh, maybe a boa or something. Our, our local snake's teeth are much, much smaller than this, but you can see they're, they're angled backward. Um, I've heard snake teeth referred to as Velcro uh, with an attitude because they're, they're, um, they'll are stick to you. And yes, you will bleed if you get bit, but uh, if it's not a venomous snake, it's really, um, it's a very shallow puncture. Uh, you clean it up a little bit, you're going to heal just fine. But if you look at the back of the snake's mouth here to where the jaw connects, the upper and lower jaws come together, you'll see that um, there's a little bit different bone arrangement there. There's actually three bones there. And when the snake opens its mouth, now this is a different snake. And as we can, we can tell by the presence of fangs here, this is a, a venomous species. Um, I just used this photo so you could see how these bones are. They don't, nothing unhinges, but the way these bones kind of uh, open up, it's sort of the way a, a bicycle chain um, links together, it allows the snake to open its mouth very, very wide, uh, almost uh, completely vertically. Um, the other advantage that snake mouths have over ours, I, I think of it as an advantage anyway, is that the lower jaws are not hinged. So there's, see this gap here? These two jaws are, uh, they can function independently and they do as we'll see in the next slide. So, you know, snakes, they don't have hands. They don't use um, utensils when they feed. They just use their mouths. Those teeth are not for chewing. They're just for gripping. So as the snake uh, pulls the prey um, down, um, it's eventually as, it, as the prey moves, past the mouth, muscles are gonna take over and the prey item is going to be pulled downward. But at the beginning, it's the work of these uh, two lower jaws kind of walking forward and pulling back and um, getting the prey to move backwards through the mouth. So, um, you know what, I could explain it till I'm, um, I'd say blue in the face, but I turned the blue light off. Uh, I keep talking about it, but let's just watch. This is Billy Bull Snake, and this is a, um, I believe this is a chipmunk that he's feeding on. This is not a uh, chipmunk that we went out and caught. This was donated. It's a safe prey item. Um, all right, let's, I just got a message that this isn't playing very well. Hopefully you can see Billy's jaw twisting and getting a hold of that chipmunk. Um, and you can see it's it's going in. Uh, the two sides of that lower jaw are reaching forward and pulling back and reaching forward and pulling back. Um, once the chipmunk gets about um, three quarters of the way, right about here. Now you can see the, the throat 
is widening and those muscles are going to start uh, contracting and pulling that um, little creature down, down, down. I always, Billy, Billy's a great eater. He's also um, our largest snake, so it's really easy to see what's going on. Billy is just about nine feet long. Bull snakes are um, our largest, Illinois' largest snake uh, in terms of length, and I think weight too. But there he is. Um, in just about two minutes, he has that whole creature gobbled down. Oh, uh, he's got just a little bit of tail left. Oh, I'll turn the sound off. I don't know what we were talking about there, but um, that's um, about how long you would see a snake in the wild taking to consume a prey item as well. Uh, I thought about putting in another video, which would be, uh, would show one of our corn snakes feeding, but if corn snakes, they've been bred as uh, for the pet trade for a very long time. Uh, Billy is Billy was bred in captivity. In fact, uh, one of Billy's parents was an albino, so his coloring is a little bit uh, unusual. It's a little bit lighter than what you'd see on bull snakes in the wild, but um, he still has that kind of wild quality. He wants to feed pretty quickly because when a snake is eating they're also pretty vulnerable. Now, not a whole lot of, uh, not too many predators will go after a nine foot bull snake, but uh, a younger one, I'd say a two or three foot one, absolutely, a hawk could come down, uh, a, uh, a coyote could sneak up. They could certainly become prey when they are busy preying uh, and feeding on um, an, an, a food item. But the corn snakes, there's many, many more generations of breeding that have occurred. And that tendency to eat quickly has been one of the things that has kind of gone away. Sometimes our corn snakes will take 20 minutes to, to eat one mouse. Um, they're, they are well fed. Uh, so, you know, the, the drive to feed isn't there to, you know, to gobble because they're hungry. But uh, I've always thought that's interesting that a, a wild snake you know, even a, a wild snake that is, um, or a, a captive snake that is, you know, fairly closely related to its wild ancestors is going to retain that quick feeding cotton. So, so um, two minutes to eat a chipmunk. I challenge you guys to try and beat that record. All right, let's move along. Um, I got an email the other day from a woman. Uh, she said that she wanted to know if we knew anything about pokeweed. I think I have a, a large pokeweed growing in my garden. I thought it was a cool looking plant until my husband looked it up on his phone, discovered it is quite poisonous. I'm freaking out right now. How do I get rid of this? Um, who can I get to remove it? It sounds like it's going to be very dangerous. Um, if you have any advice, I'd really appreciate it. Well, um, this is a great example. I, I didn't ask, but I suspect that the, the search term that was used was pokeweed poisonous. Um, when, you, when you look for something to be poisonous, you're going to find that it is. Um, I think we're learning, we're all learning a lot about the dangers of um, uh, Google research and what can happen um, to, you know, how you can skew your own results and where you, you think you've learned everything you need to know. All you've done is found out, um, you know, you, you've, uh, depending on what search terms you put in, you've only learned what Google thinks you should know. Um, and also pokeweed, a lot of people do consider it a weed. And um, I know I've, I've joked with other nature friends at how when you look up something that maybe isn't super, uh, it's not universally liked, the first results that tend to show up uh, in a search engine are how to get rid of. So uh, clearly this person was quite concerned and I was more than happy to allay her fears. Um, this is a plant that grows prolifically throughout this area. And if it, it starts off like this, and if you let it go, you're gonna get more and you're gonna get more. Um, it's a very successful plant. It is a native plant. Now, um, 
I asked our restoration crew where they stand on pokeweed because 10 years ago at the park district, uh, pokeweed was on the uh, get rid of list. Um, even though it's a native plant, it does reseed prolifically. Those little berries are super popular with um, uh, anything that eats berries, um, except for humans because it is toxic to humans. But um, our current crews, you know, they'll, they'll let it go in some areas uh, if there's a very sensitive, uh, and this plant does tend to grow uh, more on say woodland edges. If, if there's a sensitive plant that they're trying to make room for, pokeweed isn't going to get to stay. But in a lot of areas, because it does offer uh, several benefits to local wildlife, um, they just let it go. I know here at Casa Otto, I, uh, let it go to a certain extent. I've got some here in the backyard. I was letting it go in the front yard until it got out of hand, so it's gone away. I did not die in the process. Now, um, some people do have a reaction. Uh, the, the juices and the, the uh, stem of pokeweed is quite fleshy. Um, it's very juicy. Um, I have not worn gloves, and I have not had a reaction, but that doesn't mean that uh, you won't if you've not handled it before. Gloves are recommended. What I do when I wanna get rid of it is I, I lap it off down at the base. It has an enormous root, depending on how long you've let it go, it, it can grow a very, very large uh, tap root. But if you lap it off at the ground and then you uh, use a foam brush to dab on a little bit of uh, Roundup, uh, you're, you're directing the herbicide just on the root. Uh, you're not spraying it all over the place. Uh, that should take care of that individual plant. Uh, uh, the key there is if you don't want a lot of pokeweed, make sure you stay on it early and you um, get rid of it before it gets out of control because look at all these berries. In fact, it is a super successful plant. I took this picture uh, it Saturday here in the backyard. Um, on the, this is on one plant, it's blooming. It's got berries that are forming and it's got ripe berries. So it's still attracting pollinators, um, which uh, there are a number of pollinators that are attracted to those little white flowers. And it's also enticing seed dispersers to come by, uh, like catbirds, um, honeybees uh, come to the flowers. And then um, I, I went out uh, the other morning under the deck and I saw this in the uh, in the bird bath here on the railing and it was it was pretty cool it looked kind of like somebody had tie-dyed the water uh, that is pokeweed remnants and it reminded me that there was a fairly persistent story that circulated several years ago saying that pokeweed ink was used in the signing of the declaration of independence um that's a classic example of folklore. Um, yes, pokeweed berries can be crushed and it can, the juice is very, very dark. It can be used to make an ink that um, lasts, I think, a, a fairly long, I don't think it would last 200 years, but um, if you're desperate <laughs> for ink and you've got poke, uh, pokeweed growing nearby, yes, um, you can uh, use it to make ink. But um, Again, you, you do not want to uh, eat it. So no, it was not used to sign the Declaration of Independence, um, but it was used to make a, a very clear signature there in the bird, uh, bird bath. Um, now, there are some people, and I, I, I think I'm gonna try this in the spring. That's the season I would feel most confident doing this. Um, very young uh, pokeweed, just as it's coming up out of the ground, you can uh, pick it and you can boil it to remove the toxins. Most of the recipes I've read say to boil it twice, empty the water each time, and then you use it as you would any cooked green. Uh, I talked to a gentleman several years ago who was harvesting some, and he said that it was a recipe his grandma had taught him. It's very popular in the South. Um, he, he would... Um, saute the greens and then uh, stir in uh, scram and, and make scrambled eggs with it. He said, you, you saute the greens in bacon grease, stir in a couple eggs. And then he said, it's just um, mm -mm, good. Uh, there's a 
a song, uh, uh, Pog Salad Annie, uh, by I believe Elvis was one of the people who recorded it. I'm not sure if he's the one who wrote it, but uh, that refers to the eating of this plant as well. Um, so I, I might try it uh, next spring. If I do, I'll certainly let you know about it. So speaking of eating, on the other side of my yard, I've had these uh, ground cherries growing for quite some time. And this was kind of a weird coincidence. I was collecting uh, produce for our um, the community gardeners that donate produce to uh, the Salvation Army Food Pantry. Uh, I was picking up that produce the other day and I noticed that there's an untended uh, garden plot an abandoned garden plot right next to the uh, produce bin at Primrose Farm. I had a lot of tomatillos in it uh, growing amongst the weeds. So I, I actually took a couple and I brought them home and I uh, put them in, I made a little uh, like fresh salsa that I put on, uh, I think I was having scrambled eggs that morning. And then uh, the next morning I was in my own backyard. Here's a ground cherry. Ground cherries and tomatillos are actually uh, related. You, you can eat these uh, ground cherries that grow on here, but they are not as tasty as the um, variety that's uh, labeled tomatillo. But uh, you'll notice in my hand there, uh, there's the skins of the paper skins of the little berry that's inside um, these ground cherries. I did not open these. Uh, somebody was in the yard the night before feeding on them. I don't know who the ground cherry feeder is. I am suspecting it's an opossum, but uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I thought it was funny. I had done the exact same thing, <laughs> saw these growing, picked them, opened them up and ate them. And then the, the, the next night, somebody in my yard did the same thing with the, uh, the native or weedy version of ground cherry. So it's something that's happening right now. Um, and uh, a lot of people look at these thinking they look a little bit like uh, paper Japanese lanterns, but um, yeah, they're ground cherries. We've got a couple different types here, the tall ground cherry and the clammy ground cherry. Um, and um, the critters are feeding free food for everybody. So um, I saw this plant the other day. I was uh, doing a walk with a group in um, North Aurora and we came across this plant and they said, oh, why is that, why is that uh, monarch on that weed? And then they saw the distinctive um, seed pods here and they realized it was a type of milkweed, but it was a type that was unfamiliar to them. Now, I learned this one kind of by chance uh, about 20 years ago uh, when I worked for the Fox Valley Park District. We used to do uh, prairie tours of a tiny little plot called the Aurora Prairie. We did uh, field trips there. I don't know if it's, it's, it's definitely still there. In fact, um, uh, some of our uh, local stewards have been involved in its um, caretaking this past year or two. It's maybe four acres. It's got a small loop trail through it. Anyway, uh, this world milkweed is quite prolific, uh, or at least it was at the Aurora Prairie. And it's funny how it looks nothing like common milkweed. It doesn't look at all like swamp milkweed. In fact, its blossom looks like this. It's a white bloom. And you can see the foliage is quite diminished. It grows maybe, I don't know, three feet high or so. Uh, it's not nearly as tall as common milkweed, but the monarchs know it and uh, they will lay, lay eggs on it. This is a caterpillar that's probably in its chrysalis stage now. It was um, larger than my pinky finger when we saw it uh, last Thursday. So anyway, just another milkweed. If you're looking to mix up your offerings, to uh, the monarchs, this might be one you'd want to consider. It's it's very popular with the monarchs. I wouldn't say it's super popular uh, amongst gardeners because it's it's one of the less showy milkweeds. But anyway, just something to to uh, keep in mind if you're looking to diversify your um, milkweed offerings for our friends the monarchs. Now, um, this was an awesome shot that. Um, Brian Solomon, one of our restoration ecologists, had taken, uh, and it's quite timely too, 
This is um, a wonderfully camouflaged spider. Uh, different times of year, these can be known as flower crabs, but at this time of year, they're known as the golden rod crab spider. Uh, it's a spider and it can make silk and it does make silk, but it, um, it does not use that silk to capture its prey. These guys are ambush predators and that's why this camouflage is so important. Uh, if this goldenrod had been just a little bit farther along with its blooms, Ryan probably would not have seen um, the spider. This camouflage is absolutely exquisite. So it, it hangs out there and uh, it uses these eyes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eyes in pretty much all directions there. Uh, it's looking for prey. It uh, also has to keep an eye out for uh, predators, but it hangs out there. And when it uh, sees um, something that it wants to feed on, a lot of our pollinators um, fall into that category, as do uh, does another predator called um, an ambush bug. Anyway, the the crab spider hangs out and it waits for the prey to uh, show up and then it, it strikes, it subdues it and it feeds upon it. It gets the name crab spider. You can kind of see how the legs are um, stretched out. In fact, in this picture too, um, the, the spider actually kind of flipped forward when I turned this leaf over. This was much earlier in the season. This is a red bud leaf uh, here on the right. And that's a crab spider who had just finished uh, creating this uh, egg sac. So again, they, they do not use the silk that they produce for um, catching prey, but they do use it to uh, secure their next generation. Um, so uh, something it, when you're when you're admiring um, the the rich yellow hues that we have at this time of year. Don't forget to look a little more closely because you might not be looking at just a uh, petal or um, a flower head. You might also be looking at a crab spider too. So, you know, we just keep coming back to cicadas and um, we're kind of, there. there's still very much a part of our um, orchestration during the day. You hear the four different species we have in this area um, calling from the trees, but we are kind of transitioning to uh, the next stage and a very important one, uh, not so much for the cicadas, they're, they're, when we find them like this, they're done, but they are an important food item for lots of different creatures. A lot of birds will feed on cicadas. A lot of insects will feed on cicadas. Um, as we'll see here, uh, this was um, a cicada I found the other day on a sidewalk. And you can tell the ants are just going nuts over it. Lots of good protein to be found here. And uh, it's something that, uh, again, the, the cicadas, it just is another great example of how everything is connected. Once the cicada has fulfilled its mission in life, which is to find a mate and lay some eggs, um, then it can be turned over to give life to other things, which in this case was a big swarm of um, sidewalk ants. So you'll see a lot of these. These guys, once they're done, um, they do oftentimes just kind of fall from the trees. You'll find them on sidewalks, find them in streets. Um, as we progress even farther through the season, there'll probably be even more of them showing up. And um, I always like to, to leave them lay because something is going to find a use for it. Something is going to be able to feed on it. Maybe the same thing that was eating my ground cherries, who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, you know, the, um, we talked about this phenomenon a couple of months ago about the bird deaths in the east and how the um, these birds that were dying, they, they had similar symptoms. They had crusty eyes. They were lethargic. They, uh, they tip over and, and die. Um, and um, there was 
concern that there was a disease spreading you know, throughout the, the uh, continent. And there was even advisories for a while saying, bring your bird feeders in, bring your bird baths in. Um, but then as this problem persisted, it was found to really kind of stop. Um, it only came as far west as Indiana. And the outbreak of this disease or this condition, actually the, the boundaries of it matched the, the boundaries of brood 10, the uh, most, uh, the, this year's batch of periodical cicadas. So there's that, and it, it still hasn't, there's still researchers that are working on this and nothing is certain yet, but um, the thinking is that there is a connection or there may very well be a connection between these um, sick birds and the cicadas, the periodical cicadas. Um, and uh, this uh, was on, this particular notice was on the National uh, Wildlife Federation's blog page. This was um, dated August, August 5th. And um, the advisory uh, here was saying that yes, they're still checking into it, but that it's safe to put your feeders back up. And then there was an addendum a week later saying, oh, you know what, if you live in that affected area, uh, you might still want to keep your feeders and they're still not 100% certain that it's tied into those periodical cicadas. But um, it does seem to have, have um, stop the, the birds they're not finding the uh, sick and dying birds in the numbers that they were uh, and of course the periodic cicadas are also done um, in that area so anyway if I get any more updates on that I will let you know but um, there may uh, there may in fact be a connection between those birds and those insects so let's stay in the arthropod uh, vein a little bit longer here. Um, this is uh, Narcissus americanus, our American millipede. It's pretty large. Uh, you're probably used to seeing the small and non-native millipedes that uh, we tend to show up in our basements um, and other damp areas. They really seem to like damp concrete. So um, a lot of times you'll see them on uh, bridge abutments too, if that bridge is near water, uh, damp sidewalks, bike trails, that sort of thing. You'll see these, say, inch-long dark millipedes. Those are, by and large, non-native species. But then we've got uh, our American millipede that measures about four or uh, even five inches long. Um, millipedes, again, they're different from centipedes in that they tend to, they're, they're, they're not predators. Centipedes have uh, their first pair of legs, legs has been modified into fangs, and yes, they eat other creatures. These guys fall into the class of decomposers. Um, and a centipede will have one pair of legs per body segment. And millipedes, if you look really closely here, you can kind of see especially in that middle part where it's in focus, <laughs> they have two uh, pairs of legs per body segment. Well, um, I've always thought these guys are pretty cool and they show up in uh, a few of the forest preserves we have in this area. Well, um, I got a new perspective on them last week. Uh, Kim, this was during your work day. Um, last week at, at Johnson's Mound, there was a cicada, I'm sorry, I still got cicadas on the brain. There was a millipede that was uh, crawling through the area and it had these tiny little insects on it and it caused the millipede to thrash around as if it was uh, in some sort of discomfort. And it, it, it thrashed around and then it finally uh, made its way um, into some vegetation Maybe it felt more comfortable there. Maybe it was able to shake these tiny creatures. Well, I was curious as to what they were. They, they sort of looked like winged ants. And of course there are some ants that will uh, try to feed on uh, living things, but uh, these moved a little bit differently from ants. And they, again, they really seem to be bothering this poor millipede. Well. Did a little bit of digging and found out that there is a group of flies 
that parasitize millipedes. Myriophora um, and myriapod is um, the group that millipedes belong to, myriapod, many legs. So myriophora um, is this group of flies, and I'm not even going to try to guess what kind of species it is, but they do in fact lay their eggs um, and their larvae then will feed off of um, these millipedes. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting that even you know, something like a millipede that seems really well protected with that exoskeleton. Uh, they also produce defensive chemicals in the case of the American millipede. They're called benzoquinones and they are, uh, they have kind of a, almost like a chlorine scent to them. Uh, we've got uh, some other millipedes in this area that have yellow markings and they produce a defensive chemical that smells like amaretto because uh, it's got cyanide in it. Um, but anyway, even uh, the, the uh, hard exoskeleton and the defensive chemical didn't seem to be deterring these flies. So yeah, everything has a check or a balance. Uh, it just never ceases to amaze me. Even millipedes have their nemesis. <laughs> And speaking of nemesis, um, it is definitely time for wasps. And, you know, they, they, if there's an insect around here that has a, a bad reputation, it's wasps. Or, and, and the even more unfortunate thing is that when somebody gets stung, they usually say, oh, I got stung by a bee. But there are so many um, wasps that are beneficial uh, even the two that are pictured here, which are widely blamed for stings at this time of year, um, they have a lot of good qualities. Uh, on the left here, we have um, a yellow jacket wasp, and on the right, we have a bald-faced hornet, which uh, in fact is a type of wasp too. Uh, there, there are actual hornets that exist in the world, but I don't think we have any around here. I think they're mostly European, but bald-faced hornet is um, a type of wasp. Uh, they're the ones that make those large paper nests up uh, in the trees. And then the yellow jacket wasp, there's, there's actually a, a couple different groups of them too. Some are in the same genus as the bald faced hornet and they make their nests uh, above ground. And then there's the yellow jackets, like the Eastern yellow jacket and the German yellow jacket that we have around here that make their nests in the ground. Uh, the other day I was out for a walk and I came upon this tree stump, it's a dead tree, and I saw there was a lot of activity. Um, I'm going to turn this down because I, uh, I don't know if I was talking to myself, but look at, look at these uh, like fighter pilots, these yellow jackets are zooming in and out um, of, there's a, a hole somewhere down here. So, so you saw that that uh, that tree trunk there. I stuck my hand in to make this video. You can see the shadow there uh, where I'm holding my phone. Didn't get stung. These wasps just kind of you know zoomed around me, and I thought, wow, that's pretty awesome. I'm not a threat to them, and they recognize that. And they just let me be. Well, so I, I went off on my walk. This was over at the, uh, the Arboretum, that's Lake Marmo in the background there. Um, I went on my way and I would say I was at least 30 feet, probably more like 50 feet away. And I saw there was a yellow jacket on my hand. And then I you know, kind of flicked it away. And then I saw I had two on my shirt and I had another one on my arm. And then I felt one stinging me on my elbow. So they tracked me down and stung me and warned me, you know, that I should be leaving them alone. I, I don't know. You know, I, um, I don't know the, the value of that behavior. You'd think if they didn't want me messing with their nest, they would have stung me while I had my hand and, and was kind of, um, you know, immobile there. 
it would have been really easy for a whole bunch of them to just really nail me on the hand and the arm. But um, the guards, maybe they were busy doing something else and the, the queen sent them out later. I don't know what it was, but uh, they did get me. And um, I was a little itchy at the sting site for a couple of days, but um, I just thought that was a pretty cool and, and pretty interesting um, yellow jacket defensive behavior. They know you, they recognize you, they track you down. Um, and then this, this next video, I have uh, Kelly and Greg to thank. Um, this is a fine example of a bald faced hornet nest. I think we've got some video here too. Um, and so the, uh, you can see the uh, wasp going in. These guys are, as are the yellow jackets, they prey on soft bodied insects, which they bring back and feed to um, their growing colony. The, um, one of the, the more popular prey items for both these types of wasps is caterpillars, but they also feed on uh, things like flies and even mosquitoes. Um, these sorts of nests, if you are, um, and I, I don't advise getting too close to them because yes, they do track you down, but um, there at the entrance, there are usually guards that are posted and that's their job is to um, keep an eye out for intruders. And if something seems like they're getting too close, they will um, head out and give you a definite uh, deterrent. Um, I've never been stung by a bald face hornet as many times as I've uh, looked at them, watched them, taken pictures of them. Uh, in fact, a few years ago over at Delnor Woods, there was a bald face hornet nest in a hedge right by the parking lot. And you know, cars go in and out of that lot all day long. Nobody complained, nobody got stung. Um, they just, you know, went about their business. And then as uh, fall comes, and the leaves drop off the trees. That's that's actually when we usually hear about these nests. Um, this one is positioned in a way that it's visible now, but some of them are up high enough in the trees that they're really obscured right now by leaves. And it's not till it gets cold that um, and the leaves fall down that people see them. And these are a, a single, uh, they're, they're an annual life cycle type of insect won't be too much longer and they will, uh, the, the queens that have been raised for next year, they'll be leaving this nest and they're going to go and they're gonna overwinter uh, in um, decomposing logs or in deep leaf litter. They'll spend the winter that way. And then next spring they'll come out and they will start to build uh, nests of their own. She'll make the first um, few cells and surround it with paper on her own and then after she's laid some eggs, um, I should mention she, she'll mate now in the fall. She'll overwinter. And then in the spring, she will lay those eggs and she will get some help. And then the, the workers start to build the nest and enlarge it and provision it. And the queen can focus, focus on her job, which is laying the eggs. Um, now, if you're uh, as fascinated by wasps as I am, you might want to mark your calendar. You might want to register for this really awesome webinar. Uh, Heather Holm has produced uh, a new book called Wasps, and uh, she takes a look at the diversity of this group. Even though we, you know, tend to think of the the yellow jackets and the, their stinging ways as being representative of all wasps, um, there's so many different types and a lot of them um, either can't sting or, or, or won't sting um, because they are solitary. They do not have a large colony to protect. And uh, what they use their sting and their venom for is to capture the prey that they will use to feed their young. You can see by the picture on the front, every single one of those wasps is sitting on a flower. So even though they are uh, predatory, uh, they have that predatory side to their life. That's usually because they use that food, that protein to feed their young. Um, the adult, the mature wasp usually uh, takes um, nectar uh, and, and pollen uh, to feed on for itself. So uh, really, really cool book and really, really cool webinar. Um, 
I would be lax too if I didn't mention another cool webinar um, coming up uh, that uh, the Heather Holmes uh, Heather Holm, Holmes webinar is on October 20th and um, a webinar with Doug Tellamy is on Tuesday, October 5th. Um, Doug, of course, has written um, uh, Nature's Best Hope and Bringing Nature Home and now his latest book, The Nature of Oaks. Um, he's an entomologist at the University of Delaware, and he has just keeps spreading the good word about native plants. And um, in fact, his research uh, on into the number of uh, lepidopterans that are associated with oak trees is, is cited all over the place. It's some, over 500 species on the white oak tree. Uh, 500 different types of butterflies and moths on the white oak tree. But these are both brought to us, both of these webinars come from uh, Wild Ones organization. If you're not a member, yeah, you, you actually don't have to be to join into these webinars. Um, but there, uh, there is certainly an opportunity to sign up. It's a great group. And uh, our local chapter has recently changed its name to reflect its growth. It used to be Northern Cane, and now it's, um, Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Greater Cane Wild Ones. Uh, so a couple of cool things you might want to mark your calendar for if you care about things like wasps and oak trees. <laughs> so um, next week, we are going to take a closer look at goldenrod, as well as another seasonal favorite plant, uh, the jewelweed. I got a couple of, um, right now I'm calling them mystery scat and mystery nest uh, emails and texts that I've received. If we solve the mysteries by next week, I'll certainly uh, walk you through the steps that we used to do that, but I'm not all that hopeful. We've been stumped for a while now, but they're pretty cool. Can't wait to share them with you. Um, reader emails, and of course, who knows what else is going to happen. Uh, but before we sign off for tonight, I got a couple of things uh, I also need to share with you. You might remember uh, little Mac. He was the uh, brown and knoll that uh, Laura McKenzie found in her living room. Oh gosh, this was uh, two and a half months ago or so. He had emerged from a uh, potted plant that would, had been recently purchased and added to um, you know, the windowsill. Yeah, this is, uh, I, I was I was so excited because I had had um, two past failures in trying to raise these little lizards. Now, just to give you a size perspective, little Mac there was just about, a, just a little bit bigger than my pinky finger at that time. I was so excited. In fact, you can see on his tail there is, is one of the fruit flies that I had put in the cage uh, to feed him. He was doing well, he was growing, he was shedding, he was thriving. It was um, lizards need ultraviolet light. They need the sun's light in order to be able to develop properly. So I'd started setting little Mac out in his cage on my deck. And there was one day where I put him in a new spot because I thought he could get better dappled sunlight. And my mistake was that it wasn't dappled. It was full on sun. And when I realized it, I brought him inside, but it was, alas, too late. And little Mac is no longer. So this is strike three for me with raising brown anoles that have emerged from tropical plants. I'm, I'm still, you know, up for trying again if one turns up. In fact, I did go to Home Depot and kind of haunt the uh, the tropical plant area just to see if there were any lizards, um, you know. It had to escape there. The woman at the store in uh, Geneva had told me a couple of years ago, she said, oh yeah, we see the lizards all the time. I didn't see any that day, but anyway, if you or anybody you know happens to come upon another brown anole and, and you don't want to deal with it and you want to let me try again, um, I still have fruit flies and I would be glad to uh, try. But anyway, um, alas, little Mac is no longer um, got one last thing here. Um, I saw this and I also uh, got a text uh, from Susie saying that today is, what is it, National Beer Day or National Beer Appreciation Day. Um, I thought that was a, a great way to end the, uh, tonight's program. I'm going to 
uh, stop the screen share. And I'm going to prepare to have a frosty beverage of my own as we ease into our evening. Um, it looks like we've got some chats here to uh, tackle first. Um, okay, so we've got some comments here on pokeweed. Um, yeah, Kim, um, poke. Okay, so boiling the leaves at least three times. I, and that's the sort of thing, you know, you read these recipes about pokeweed and, and every single one of them emphasizes how if you don't do it right, you're gonna regret it. Um, so I had heard two times, but if it takes three times, um, you better safe than sorry, I, I might do that, know to that for next year. And yeah, I have pulled it with bare hands, had no reaction. Yeah, me too. Um, but uh, again, especially the this woman who rode in, she seemed very, very wary of the plant. And I would hate to have her pull it with her bare hands and then come back to me later and say, well, Pam, you said that it was going to be safe. And now look at me. So anyway. Um, and uh, Mrs. Trisha apparently has two, but I don't remember what we were talking about. Oh, um, Maybe the pokeweed, huh? Um, Diane, how many species um, can we find in Kane County? Ooh, um, let's see, there's, uh, you know what? My Dick Young book is just inside in the kitchen. I was looking up some things um, this afternoon. Well, there's there's common milkweed and there's swamp milkweed and there's, um, uh, the, uh, I think I think I think Kim answered it for me already. Read down the chats. Oh. <laughs> at least, or you know what? I would say there's got to be at least ten. <laughs> um, thanks, Kim. Perfect. Of, uh, but I Thank you. Four. <laughs> thanks for saving me, Di. <laughs> um, and yeah. yeah. You know, if you go to Taylor Creek Restoration Nursery site, they list about 10, 10 species that you can buy. So just so well, you know. Maybe that would be a, a fun challenge to, to try and name them all. Just like, you know, I try to name my friends cats and dogs. I'll see if I can start to, you know, remember things like native milkweed species. Maybe I'll have a drink and think about that. Um, uh, Aurora Prairie. Um, gosh. Chris, that is on the um, south, let's see, south, let's see. You know what, Chris, I will send you directions and if anybody else wants directions uh, too, I, um, it is, uh, I know how to drive there. I don't remember the names of the streets. Um, you can probably look it up on the Fox Valley Park District website. Um, you know what, while I'm, Yammering here, I could have been uh, looking up uh, the directions here, Laura Prairie, uh, Laura. But it's it's a tiny little um, little chunk. Uh, it's not even showing up. It's just I'm just getting directions for Prairie Street. Um, so. Uh, I will get that to you, Chris, because it, it's a nice little loop. You and Mouse Mouse could en enjoy a little walk there. Maybe go around it three or four times to get your steps in. Um, oh, that's that's a good suggestion. Um, so there's a little suggestion for Laura on where Mac came from. Um, grow uh, over on Third Street. Um, <laughs> I will. That's a great local uh, connection because I tell you, when I was at Home Depot this most recent time looking for them, all I got was a bunch of weird looks. And when I asked about lizards, um, I was waiting for them to call source security on me. So anyway, thanks for that tip, Laura. Maybe we will have yet another run at raising the brown knoll. With that, um, everybody, great to see you again. Um, it's not Miller time. It is um, vanilla porter time. But mm -hmm. spending your Tuesday evening, a chunk of it here uh, together with us, having some good natured fun. Hope to see you back next week. Have Cheers. a good one, everybody. Thanks, Pam. Cheers. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Have a good night. Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye.
Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Pam. <laughs>